Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, episode 21. I'm Jimmy, this is Francis, and this is a show where we chat about bike stuff. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. How are you, Emily? I'm good. Mm. Did you enjoy your weekend? Yes. Me too. I ran up and down the top of the struggle hill climb, which was the national hill climb champs, about 100 times. My legs are absolutely fluffed. Were you running your Garmin? Were you recording the activity? No. So technically I haven't done any of it, which oh. is disappointing. Oh, jeez. My watch told me off. It said, you're very tired. You should have another rest day. Did you? No. I've come to work, which is not restful. But that was two days ago. Was it two days? Have you lost a day? Oh, no. Yesterday I did a turbo. And, okay. and edited for 12 hours. Yeah. I spent a long time editing. So we were at the National Hill Climb Champs and these guys weighed over 70 bikes at the top of the climb, missed the whole hill climb event. <laughs> it was great atmosphere, uh, which I got to enjoy and you didn't get to see any of. Well, I was meant to be competing because that was, you know, it's, it's literally been the pinnacle event for me for my entire cycling career. Yeah, and I got, I got an entry, had my start time all logged in and I said to you earlier in the week, you and Emily, right, so uh, my time's this, does that work? And you both said no. You would have won. Well, I could have. The Lantern Rouge. I could have because I was entered. But we'll never know because of you people. We're never going to know. Well, I mean, we might know. We might know that you wouldn't have won. Do we, though? I had a seven kilo steel race bike. You were meant to be racing and then you were meant to be presenting, but you couldn't remember the questions to ask. Oh, so you're, you're digging me out now as well. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an amazing event. We have produced bunch of content on the YouTube channel. Uh, if anyone wanted to check it out, there's a 26 minute video featuring over 70 bikes. I think it might be 70, maybe 71. Uh, of all different varieties. There's the super light bikes, the people with the weight weenies who are shaving off bits of handlebar and gluing on their saddles and gluing their cleats. Was that one of the guys? Uh, and right up to steel bikes. There's a guy riding like a 10 kilo, 11 kilo steel bike, which was nice to see. There's loads of normal bikes there. My hero. Yeah, really good, really good. And lots of weird and wonderful stuff. So if you want to see some of that, check it out on the YouTube channel. Uh, the big news was that the event was won by Andrew Feather on disc brakes. Road CC called it a dark day for cycling. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, it, is it actually confirmed that it's the first time it's happened? Uh, the first national hill climb champs, I believe. So we're pretty confident that's... Accurate. I think a lot of people have claimed it. I'm, I'm guessing it is. I think so. If, if Andrew Feather, that is his name, isn't it, Andrew? I think he's won it every year. He, he's well, yeah, he's if, a pretty legitimate if, source. If he, he wins source, it every single year. Then it must be true. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I've got to be honest. I didn't know enough about Andrew Feather when we talked about it in the last podcast. And I, I thought he was mainly good at the shorter hill climbs. Like your normal hill climb specialist, British hill climb specialist, the, the rides are fairly short. You know, two, three, four minute efforts. The struggle is like 12 minutes long, 13 minutes long. Uh, so I thought maybe Ed would have more of a chance, who is his biggest competitor. Uh, but no, they're both really good at this kind of distance as well. So it proved, I mean, they were leagues ahead. What was the, the guy who came third was over a minute down. On Andrew. Yeah. And Ed was. Close to a minute there as well. Ed was 18 minutes down on Andrew. Seconds. And then third place was one minute 17 down on first. Ed Laverick, who obviously came second, he wrote on Strava, absolutely gutted and in total disbelief. I was so sure that this, the single greatest performance of my whole career would be enough. I got the 445 watt, 7.4 watts per kilo pacing, bang on, 7.4 watts per kilo, which was the breakthrough performance I had last week in training. And I was in no doubt with myself that I could replicate it. Then I could do more than enough based on the performances in the run-up. Speaking from the heart, I expected to win and, in was, and was in full belief with my prep, my pacing, and the huge support from everyone on this big day. I'm totally dejected that this performance wasn't enough to win this year and I leave feeling lost, dejected, and empty. I'll get ribbed for taking it so seriously, but it's just how I feel. Sharing is caring. Well done, Andy, for taking the win. To all those that took on the hill, those that filled the podium spots and those first timers, thank you to the wonderful organizers too. 
I think that's a very nice statement, and I don't think it's fair that he'd get ribbed for caring. I hope about he what he does has some good mates around him because my experience of people really go into town on an effort is there's always a bit of a fallout afterwards. Yeah. So hopefully he's got good mates around him, good family around him, and uh, he rides the wave over the next couple of weeks, which inevitably is going to have a lot of ups and downs because, you know, it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. You know, it's hard. It's horrible. Mm-hmm. It's brutal. But sh- yeah. he, he should be, ha- you know, I, I, I hope he gets to the point that he is happy with what happened because obviously what he's done is unbelievable. It's crazy. Those uh, it's astronaut astronomical numbers they're producing. Mm. Those guys are in a league of their own. This is professional level, like world tour power numbers. We're talking from both of them. It's obscene. Why are they not in the world tour then? Cause they got jobs. Well, why? Um, I mean, I can't really speak for Ed because I haven't spoken to him about this, but he, I get the vibe that he enjoys what he does now, which is producing YouTube content, coaching, and doing these kind of shorter event, hill climb events as a specialist. He enjoys that much more than he used to with traditional racing when he was a professional. He rode for JLT Condor and a couple of other teams, a very high level full time. So, so basically the top end of British. Yeah, top end of British stuff. Well, that, well, even that, the uh, JLT Condor team uh, run by John Herity, fantastic DS. And he was known for always taking his riders to abroad, to big stage races. You know, they would be doing like a uh, tour of Japan and things like that. So there was always really big events that they were doing. So it was more of like a, a pro lifestyle compared to some of the British teams. Um but yeah, Ed's had a taste of both clearly, and he likes what he's doing now. So it's interesting. I, I would, I would like. We should maybe have a chat with Ed sometime. Maybe oh, get definitely. him on the podcast because he will be able to explain the difference. And I think this is the bit I find really interesting: is what is the difference between a British hill climb specialist like him and Pogacar? You know, In- like the top end of professional cyclists, like how are they actually different athletes? Mm-hmm. And obviously, there's no way. We, we don't know that. So maybe we should get him in and have a chat about that because I think that's a really interesting conversation. Yeah, there's only so much you get from looking at the power numbers, right? Mm-hmm. You go like, oh yeah, they're close, so they must perform the same, but their training is so specific. Um, it's a bit like the, the British crits, the tour series crits. There's been world tour riders. There's been world tour riders in the past who've come and entered though, you know, they've stepped down from world tour ended up in tour series and they're like, what the hell is this? This is so fast. And they're not winning off the bat because it's a very specific skill. And I think the same thing with hill climbs, if you train for it specifically and Ed is predisposed to being good at those kind of events. Um, so yeah, we'll get him on Ed. If you want to come and be on podcast. I guess now that I have all of this hill climb fitness ready for the event that I didn't get to do, I should probably just roll it on into next year. Yeah. So you got mad TSS right now from the couple of rides you did with me. So if you guys are planning on doing more videos for Cade Media next year, I'm not interested. I'm mm. I'm I'm going to be competing. Just so you know, I'm putting that out there now. I'm excited to see it. Twelve months notice. It's a I'm, holiday request. I'm excited. <laughs> what else happened? Oh yeah, do you remember? Uh, so Nick casually said to me, uh, mechanic Nick, who's always with us and featured in loads of videos. He was just like, oh, yeah, I might come down to the hill climb. I was like, oh, just jump in with us. And then we, well, just before we started setting up to spend five hours filming or whatever it was, I was like, oh, you know, you, like, what are you planning? Where are you going to go? He was just like, oh, I'll just hang around with you guys. I was like, all right, I'll give you a job then. So we gave him five hours worth of weighing bikes. <laughs> he didn't see any of the race. So his, his, uh, his exciting holiday, surprise holiday, <laughs> entailed sharing, sharing a bed with me in a Premier Inn. Yep. <laughs> me telling him, 15 times in during the night. I don't know w- what intervals to stop snoring, please. <laughs> I got zero sleep and then we weighed bikes all day. Mm-hmm. But I think he still had a nice time. He was very happy. Oh, he loves it, doesn't he? He likes to look at the bikes rather than the riders on the thing. Although it would have been nice for like, I could have given him a break and I didn't because I was busy uh, filming the T-Rex on the climb. I did shout at him a few times because as you know, Nick loves to talk. And there's lots of people there he knows, so he'd be chatting away, and I'd just be like, Nick, get back here. 
he gets distracted. Yeah, we literally, well, I put him to work, which is a bit harsh, I guess. A bit harsh. Uh, other standout performance I want to mention is our good friend, Harry Mack, who forgot his skin suit. <laughs> so he was wearing Calvin's, Calvin's a lot smaller than Harry. So he's wearing Calvin's jersey, which I think ended up quite aero because it, it was tight on Harry. Pink jersey. Um, rocked up to the start line. Rode up the climb. Was high-fiving people on the way up. Finished fourth. <laughs> six seconds off a podium, which the skin suit, I mean, you can never, it, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Probably would have come third. Uh, got to the top of the climb. Someone gave him a beer straight away, which he downed. By the time I interviewed him, he he was... Maybe it was more than one beer. Yeah, he was yeah. in his own world. Funny. I love Harry's approach to bike racing. Well, he was shouting at people after he crossed the line because he carried on riding. Mm. And obviously just past the line is everyone that's passed out on on the floor. And he was just shouting, get out of the way. Yeah, he just rode past. He rode yeah. through. Maybe he was just on a normal ride. Maybe he didn't even know he was doing the hill climb. Uh, like, what are these people on the climb? Perhaps, yeah. Like, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> Have you ever seen... A, a, a Remy Gaillard video. That's the, my French pronunciation. Remy Gaillard. He was an old, like, French prankster. He made loads of videos around year 2000s, you know, like the classic YouTube pranks before YouTube pranks were a thing. And there's one called Tour de France. Right. And he put a link to it somewhere in this video description. And basically, Remy organized a crowd of 200, 250 people all dressed in like, it was like the, being at the struggle, you know, mad like cycling fans with banners, vuvuzelas, all of these cowbells and stuff and just descended on a climb round one of the bends of Alpe d'Huez or similar climb in France. I didn't recognize it. And then they just catch people unawares as they climbed up the climb and when they're just out for their normal ride and then suddenly like a motorbike comes past with a lap board and then they, they, they think they've been mistaken as in the race. It's a very good video. You'd absolutely crap yourself if that happened, wouldn't you? I'd be like, oh, I'm not, the guys are going like, oh, I'm not in the race, I'm not in the race. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like so many people and they'll like pat him on the back. That's quite good, <laughs> it actually. took you a minute to work out what I was saying then. You, you seem very unamused and now you're like, oh, actually, that's, I'd have a bit of that. Well, I was... I you would love that. I was like, what would I do in that scenario? And I was like, well... Join in. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I do. I feel like I need to apologize to the guy that we interviewed and he was really excited about being interviewed. And then once we'd finished, he went off and was like, yes, I'm going to be on GCN. And I was like, oh. Oh. <laughs> that's not us. Where were GCN? They were, they were there, apparently. A video appeared. But I didn't see any. Apparently, they just send drones everywhere now. They just record from Bristol or wherever they are. Oh. <laughs> Long range mm. drone. Mm. Just, just everything's done by drone now. Because they're, you know, they're pretty tech. It's big time. Moving on, we have more bad news for the cycling industry. Last week it was Ribble. Ribble? No, Ribble are fine. Last week it was uh -oh. Wiggle. Oh, have you just predicted something? <laughs> oh my goodness. UK bike brand Isla Bikes have announced they're closing after 18 years. That's very sad. They're known primarily for children's bikes, like really well-made children's bikes. Uh, they blame difficult and turbulent times. Meanwhile, British Cycling are cutting jobs, according to a leaked document seen by Cycling Weekly. British Cycling says it's due to lower than forecasted sponsorship. They've also seen a 7% drop in membership. It comes after British Cycling signed a controversial eight-year sponsorship deal with oil giant Shell, but they're still missing a headline sponsor. Why is it that so many of us hate British Cycling? <laughs> they don't do very much for the grassroots racing that we see. Do they do anything for anyone? Even, yeah, track cycling. Because <laughs> they fund the Team GB development stuff? Or just Team GB in yeah, general? Yeah, well, they used to have, like, the Road Academy and stuff like that as well, where it was young riders getting into road racing. And that's what I would see firsthand. Like, oh, yeah, you know, British Cycling there, they're supporting the riders. That's gone. Can we explain for people who are listening from outside the UK what function British cycling serves? Like as a regular cyclist, how would you interact with them? Uh, insurance and if you're racing, racing license, you have to be, it's, a govern, it's the governing body. So uh, except for CTT events, which are separate cycling time trials. So like the TTs you would see on a, a road 
all over the country. Um, British Cycling does all the crits, all the cyclocross, all of the road racing, road racing, all of that stuff. Track, yeah. But then, well, well, also mountain biking, yeah. BMX racing and all yeah. of that kind of stuff. I just said all the cycle. It's not all the cycle. Some of them are separate events. Even the track has separate events, like the uh, Thunder Crit. That's not a BC event. But yes, but, but most not, of it is. They're not like qualifying events. So if you were really good at um, Thunder Crit, you're not going to get called up to Team GB probably because they wouldn't acknowledge you. True. Yeah. All of the main events throughout. So for non-racing cyclists, BC, so British Cycling have a um, membership which gives you insurance if you had some kind of accident and some discounts. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Why do you think that their membership has dropped? Is it less people racing or is it that there's more insurance companies around? So that is diluted? That's a definite strong point. So a lot of, there was a handful of cases in the last 10, 15 years where cyclists have ended up being prosecuted and losing a lot of money because they didn't have insurance to cover their public liability. Um, I think a lot of bike insurance companies now offer that. So, for example, your, is it lacquer, is it pronounced that, and pedal cover and pedal this and bike that insurance people, that a lot of them will have public liability as part of their policies now. So you don't need a British Cycling, British cycling membership. I don't have a British Cycling membership because I just hate British Cycling for some reason. Why do you hate them so much, Jimmy? Um, I, I think the reason I started to hate them was when I started getting into racing. And you pay X amount to enter a race, and then you inevitably have to pay a little bit extra to join the, the race series. And then you then have to get a British Cycling Race membership, which costs a certain amount of money. And then you have to get this and you have to get... I, I hated the process. I wanted it... And bearing in mind, I came from running, which basically meant if you wanted to enter pretty much any running race in the world, you give someone money, you're in. Like, that's it. You pay your entrance free or it's even free. Um, and then you turn up and you race. Whereas to enter a bike race at a completely amateur level, you have to have a membership of a minimum standard. Uh, a, with a photo and carry a license card with you. And then you had to get your race entry, your series entry, have all of the equipment. And I think the process of it upset me so much that I was just instantly had my back up. You do all of that and then you turn up to the race, turn up to a couple of races, meet the organizers, and then you realize that all of them are volunteers. Yep. So what are British Cycling doing? Taking people's money. And, and giving nothing. some insurance, yeah. The the whole race scene is propped up by people that love cycling. 100%. Not by memberships to British Cycling. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know. I I, I think they're a rubbish organization. We've, we've made, uh, we worked with them on a video a long time ago, and just the whole process was hideous. And like they were trying to get, it was, it was like a group ride. Francis is there as well. You filmed yeah, it, I remember. didn't you? Um, it was a group ride in Kent and it ended up being a day where it was literally snowing and it was icy and horrible. And then the guy was like, oh yeah, jump in a river. And it was just like, not <laughs> literally frozen. Happened. Yeah. That's not, isn't, you are, you're not exaggerating. It was, just, it was really weird. It was odd. It was really weird. I would say Jimmy is notoriously pessimistic. However, from people that I've talked to in London, I feel like that was the general consensus of British cycling. They don't have a great reputation. And oh, they they're missing, terrible. missing grassroots stuff. I've always wanted to create a rival to British Cycling and actually where you, like a proper not-for-profit where you collect money from memberships, they get actual value directly to themselves for that membership and all of that money goes towards hosting more races, getting people, uh, getting people which perhaps can't afford to get into racing a way of getting into racing to see if they like it. Like, I'd love to do it, but you then start looking at it and you're like, right, so this is going to cost a million pounds a year to start. And then that's just doesn't work. <laughs> it does if you get sponsored by BP. Shell. Well, no, it's a rival, isn't it? British Cycling can be Shell. I'll be BP. BP, yeah. <laughs> it's not all bad news, though, because bike insurance companies Lacker and Bicmo have just secured huge investments for European expansion. Can I, can I cut in here for a moment? Yeah. Do you know what I don't like about both of those words, those brand names? Lacquer and Bicmo. Is 
I feel like it should be Laker and Bikemo, but they're pronounced Laka and Bikemo, aren't they? Why Laker? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Ah. Laka. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Laka has raised 6.6 million pounds of VC funding, and it's going to be focusing growth on people moving to more environmentally friendly modes of transport. This has come as sales of e-bikes in Europe are expected to outstrip annual car sales by 2025. Isn't that fantastic? That's bonkers. I'm assuming that's not really representative of the UK. Sadly, not yet. Ever, probably. Um, but e-bikes are big. Big things in Italy, Spain, like people, there's a lot more e-bike riders out mm-hmm. there. Uh, whereas it's catching on here slowly, slowly. And hopefully in five years time, it's going to be even even better. Uh, UK-based insurers Bicmo have just raised £3.4 million to expand into Europe. They say 40% of their new policyholders insure e-bikes. So it's interesting that both of them have raised a very significant amount of money at a point where the industry is crumbling. However, in both cases, they are for European expansions of British businesses with a uh, target, essentially, on e-bikes. So I think Lacquer have, as part of their VC round, have also bought a European-based e-bike insurance company to as part of their, their growth. So they are both clearly very specifically targeting the e-bike insurance space, which I imagine is super niche because I imagine a lot of insurance companies don't want to get into the space of e-bikes, especially when there's been all the historic bad press around bikes setting houses on fire and things like that, which yeah. I imagine is unbelievably rare in the grand scheme of things. It, it's it's all down to, um, I was watching a YouTube video about it. It's people using the wrong chargers on the batteries. Right which is an easy mistake to make, I assume, if you're building your own e-bike, and a lot of people do that for Deliveroo and Uber Eats and that kind of thing. It's also so. some people's um, agenda to make e-bikes look bad. Definitely. Do you insure your bikes? Yes. We use, is it pedal cover, and they actually are our house insurance and bike insurance? Yes. So they're actually based in South Wales. Not that I have any connection to them, although that would be nice. Um, They are a home insurance company that also have very good bike add-ons. So we've used them for a number of years. So your bikes are covered from your house insurance as well? Yes. Yeah, okay. But they're covered for as you would cover a bike. So anywhere. It's not just covered like in a shed, if you know what I mean. Yes, yeah. Because that tends to be the problem with regular house insurance, isn't it? If it's not if it's not targeted specifically towards your bike, then sometimes, like our friend Ben, he got his bike nicked from his shed, and it was really difficult to explain to them that like the bike was worth five thousand pounds, but it had this specific group set that had been changed and this specific handlebar that had been changed. Because all they know is you buy a bike from the shop and they have a receipt, and that's how much it costs. Do you know what I mean? Um, explaining to them that stuff changes on a bike, whereas the point of our insurance is that they, they understand how bike people work, I guess. Mm-hmm. This is not an ad for them, but that's how we do it. We've never had to use it before. It well, might be this, crap. Yeah, no. this is the thing. We've never had to make a claim. And as a result of never having to make a claim, I don't know if they're good or not. You made a claim not with them, with someone else, when your bike got damaged when we went on holiday. Um, that was many years ago, and it was very good. It was very good, and I can't remember who that was. I can't either. Pedal Shoe. They're all called Pedal Something. That's the problem. Pedal Something, Bike Something, Velo, whatever. I had Pedal Shoe, and they. I was in. Uh, I was riding the white roads of Strada Bianca, and I was there to film a video with Vilia all these years ago, four or five years ago, and I hit a pothole, and my action camera bounced out of my pocket and smashed on the floor. And they even covered that. It's a 400 pound camera. Done. So they were really good. But I've never claimed. Oh, so it was my wheel. Yeah, wheel and action camera in one fell swoop. Carbon rim with a crack on it. Was that a sponsorship insurance policy or did you actually just pay for it? Uh, I had to pay for that. I was sponsored by them previously. But even while I was sponsored by them, I had to pay for insurance separately. Right. Does that make sense? Well, it does make sense. They can't just like give it to someone. It seems a bit weird. But it okay. is weird, yeah. But I kept it afterwards. 
And then you, that was luckily I had it still then. I'm excited to see more e-bikes on the road. And clearly this indicates it is happening. The faster it happens, the better. I want to cover more bikes on the channel, e-bikes. I think this is actually probably suggesting that Europe is where it's happening mm -hmm. and not here because they're <laughs> having to invest significant amounts of money to move into the European market so that they can, they can hit that, which is, and I think the problem, as we've said in other videos, I, can't, I don't think we've touched on it in the podcast because we haven't really talked about e-bikes, but the UK legislation around e-bikes is just not up. It's just not where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I would like to have an e-bike as a legitimate mode of transport, but you can't get the appropriate motors and batteries legally on a bike in this country. It needs to be a little bit faster, a little bit more powerful. I don't think it needs to be faster because they are quite fast. I think it needs to be a lot faster so it can maintain the legal speed. So, for example, uh, what's the legal limit? 17 kilometers an hour on an e-bike. No, it's, uh, it's 16 miles an hour, 24k an hour. Like that's that's fast. That is fast enough. For around town, yeah, yeah. But the motors aren't powerful enough to be able to do that speed on any kind of climb for an extended period of time. Oh yeah, yeah. It's pretty much on the flat only. So if you if if I was riding home on a legal e bike, it would still take forty minutes mm -hmm. rather than twenty minutes if it was actually able to do that speed. Yeah. I, I, I want to be able to do twenty mile an hour uphill with a big big load. And of stuff. Have so you would need probably a thousand watt motor. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Which is a long way from the 250 or whatever it is that's currently legal in this country. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed it will change. Hopefully. Now onto our big question of the week. Would you rather have continued innovation or cheaper bikes? This is off the back of last week's question about bike stuff being expensive. One of the reasons given for prices going up is tech advancements. I think this is very easy to answer. Go on then. I do not care about bike innovation. Bikes are way beyond what they need to be already. There is no more innovation needed. They are fast. They are light. They do. They have electric gears if you want them. They can literally do anything you want them to do. We don't need them to do more stuff. What we need is more access to this technology. Make it cheaper. Make it more accessible. Have easier ways for people to get into cycling. And spend more time working on the e-bike space so that even more people, again, can ride bikes. That's where the innovation should be. Do you think it, it is that not already happening? Because we've picked up bikes for 300, 400 pounds now, which are incredibly good. Don't need that much servicing. Are light, are fast, relatively. And the trickle down of that tech is the reason why they are good. Um, not the electric gears and stuff because that clearly isn't trickling down <laughs> but the you know it's the same companies making it I think the 1,000 to 3,000 pound bike should be the 300 pound bike 1,000 to 3,000 pounds should actually be 300 to 1,000 what do you mean? <laughs> well like the bike if you're if you got a bike off a shelf for 2,000 pounds yeah. It isn't worth £2,000. It should probably cost £400, £500. And I think that's the problem. I guess, you're, I guess you're arguing that you need the innovation to have an excuse for older tech that's good to become cheaper. Yeah. But you don't. You need lower marketing budgets and or to not waste huge amounts of money on marketing and tens of millions of pounds on... R&D that doesn't actually achieve anything. Uh, it's a result of capitalism again. Mm -hmm. It comes back it down to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But my, my opinion is we don't need any more innovation. Bikes are, they don't need to be better. They're, they're at a ridiculous level already. It is a ridiculous level, isn't it? Especially when you think that some of the stuff we see at the hill climb. Like if you go like, well, innovation gets lighter bikes. Well, there's, there's already bikes that are four and a half kilos. Yeah. And, and arguably function like normal bikes or can if you make a couple of tweaks. Mm -hmm. You could have a bike that's five kilos if you wanted to that fully functions like a normal road bike. What's your prediction of, do you, do you have in mind what innovation would look like within the next 10, 15 years? No. 
Nick reckons things will start going internal. That's that's his prediction. So you know, like classified hub, then you'll get a th- which is a um, a hub gear, but you can still fit a cassette to it. That's all you know inside the hub sealed. I you know, there's been some people have had issues with them, but like the Shimano Alfine and the Sturmy Archer style hubs, the planetary gears, they're getting better and better. What if that gets put inside the bottom bracket and then it's all sort of sealed away and then you're not getting weather affected, you know, things aren't getting affected by weather as much. That's his sort of vision of like, oh yeah, bikes will be all clean and you won't see any of the mechanical parts anymore. But really is the is maintaining that much of an issue at the moment? You're, no. you're saying no. No, and also if you were to do that, it would either have to become a lot heavier so that's that's probably a space that's useful for e-bikes because then you're actually venturing into like e-motorbike space mm-hmm. and actually just hiding everything away because it can be hidden away, but it's heavier, but it has a motor and therefore it all balances out. Um, I think he's de- he's definitely talked about drivetrains disappearing into bikes, but I think st- tech like that already exists. Like there's that, um, I think it's a German company that do a oil-based internal hub motor that sits in your bottom bracket and it's just like a full range of gears that are just fully internal. Everything's in oil, so it just doesn't ever, well, basically never needs any maintenance anyway, and it's a belt drive. Yeah. So the only thing you change is the belt, and the belt lasts for something like 20,000 miles or something outrageous. Yeah, yeah, you just change them when you when you just carry a spare with you. If you're riding around the world, belt drive people, would like they like that. But then the, the problem with that system is like if you wanted to have a, f- a, f- a, a smash up with your mates and changing gear is just a bit crappy currently. But, but I don't think it, is. I don't think it actually is. Like I know a guy, I used to work with a guy who was uh, a senior executive in a finance company in the city of London. So I think you can probably guess the kind of money he had. And I think he spent about 15 grand building this custom and this would have been best part of a decade ago. Mm. Um, a custom made titanium belt drive bike that still had 20 odd gears that he was going to use to race his mates up i think it was alp duez or something rather yeah and like it, it weighed something like seven kilos so it was light he was it was a big bike as well and it had all of this stuff internal and all, all like all of the gears internal and you know that that text there it's been there for ages yeah yeah and it's getting more and more efficient i get classified as the first example of that but then obviously you get loads of people like this i hate this you know like it's People have a real problem with it. Some people just hate innovation, don't they? If I think hating it for the sake of hating it is a is a good, a well, good stance. <laughs> I don't think they hate innovation. They hate change. Hmm. That's that's the beast that it's, a, it's this with. like oh everyone's forcing me to buy it, and it's like no one's really forcing you to buy it, but things do change. Like so, so I think if we go down the route of innovation of vibration reduction, a lot like there's already lots of really good products which contribute to vibration reduction, like suspension and massive tires, tires and tire pressures you know there there in theory is more innovation that could be had but do we need it do we need that innovation if it costs 100 million pounds to develop over the next 10 years then allowing more expensive products to come well redshift there you go there's products there already that that deal with lots of uh vibration dampening i i don't think like bikes work really well like motorbike you do think they work well? Yes, yeah, bikes yeah, work yeah, yeah. really well across all of dif- different disciplines. Then you then go into motorbikes, which work really, really well. So if you if you know, like you start looking at what other industries can you lend from and things like that, and make bikes more comfortable or venture into the e-bike space. Ultimately, no, we don't need more innovation. We need cheaper stuff that's got better access to. I tell you what, innovation I would love to see is um, obviously dynamos exist, but that technology going further so that you can properly power stuff on your bike using the electricity you generate or even like your turbo being able to power stuff. So like, for example, I would never ever convert to electronic shifting because I already have too many things in my life that I need to charge and it really stresses me out having to remember to charge all of the stuff. And it's the same as like, oh, I'll just get this electronic bike pump. And then you have to remember to charge that. And all your, so it's just too much mm. electric watches. And then I never remember to charge them. They stay off all the time. So if there could be like a proper function on your bike, which again might add weight, but then as the innovation proves, things get lighter and all of that kind of stuff to like properly create a 
power source through your bike to charge your stuff. Well, uh, even that tech is it already exists. Yeah, but it, yeah, you can say everything exists on the fringes, but surely the point is that it gets picked up and it becomes part of a bike that you can buy off a shelf. That's surely part of the innovation. In the same way that, you know, disc brakes probably always existed on motorbikes, but were never really a thing on bikes. And now any shop you walk into, you can pick a bike off the shelf and it that's part of innovation, isn't it? I'm I'm going to um represent old people have less tech then and then you don't need to charge things i do agree yeah and i'm not i'm not targeting that at you specifically just like if if you need something that charges have less stuff that needs charging no i agree i agree and uh, we actually get comments on that under like videos when i remember like when you did the electric pump people are like the the more reliance on electronics you have it also creates more waste as well and like batteries don't live forever and you're almost creating a solution to a problem that doesn't exist because you already have a hand pump but you're creating more need for electricity which is you know using fuel and all of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so who thinks what i think don't care about innovation want cheaper stuff i think one leads to another i think what you're you're stifling the top end will result in a slower production of cheaper good bikes and i don't know what like they already exist we've just bought 350 pound bikes and they've been fantastic never been better that's a really fair price so you're saying you want innovation because it will lead to cheaper stuff yeah this is how the world works emily I think it's just inevitable. I think if there was no innovation, we would not have anything else to talk about on our podcast anymore. <laughs> please, more innovation, please. And also, it's just makes Emily's job easier. Capitalism makes the world go around. There's, they always have to have stuff to talk about, and therefore, whether you like it or not, it's going to continue. Uh, people inventing, creating new things is uh, an amazing, right. is a fantastic thing. And I don't think that should be scoffed at, stifled in any way. Can I ask a question? Yes. How cheap do you think a cheap bike should be? What do you think is the lowest figure that it should cost someone to buy a rideable good bike? Secondhand or new? Just, just new. Like if someone goes like, do you know what, I'm going to get a bicycle. How much should it cost? Stop being distracted by the dog. It's a really hard question. It's a very hard question, Jimmy. I, I would like bikes to cost fifty pounds, but there's just I just don't see how it, how you could ever make manufacture a bike for fifty pounds with the amount of metal and stuff that's involved in it. It would just be cheese, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. and that's that's the that's the annoying. Are you asking thing. where the line is of yeah. what? Like I I guess your original question was how much should it cost, how much should it cost versus how much do you actually need to pay. In, in terms of like accessibility, you know, like if someone's like, it's such a good mode of transport, it's good for the environment, it should be more accessible. But you can, I think with 50 pounds, you can buy a bike, which you can get around town and solve those immediate problems with. But it's probably secondhand. Yeah, it's Recycle Your Bike. Yeah. You go into, uh, there's a shop nearby us called Recycle Your Bike who do up bikes and sell them on. And, you know, you're going to get a rideable, safe mode of transport. I reckon 50 to 100 pounds. We should go and do a video about it. I think if you, pen, if you spend 200 pounds, you're getting like a performance thing. You're getting a really good bike, really good bike. And if you spend 350 pounds, it's, you're, in, you're in hobby mode, right? It's a different thing. Does the problem become as well that I noticed this with like my parents and my grandparents. As you become older, you don't really understand the value of money anymore. <laughs> it's, it's meant to be the other way around. No, uh, but like <laughs> people always talk about inflation and stuff. And I do think that prices outweigh inflation, but also like five pound when I was little had a lot of value. And I feel like you can't really get anything for five pounds. Yeah, do you know what I mean? your, your brain doesn't catch up in the no. same way, does it? Like I think my first ever bike as a kid cost like 20 pounds and we got it. We had, we saw an ad in the newspaper mm -hmm. and picked it up in Newcastle. And I had like, it was like, it was probably a mountain bike or a hybrid or something like that. And I rode it loads and I don't, maybe that does exist now. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know whether it's age or just being in the industry so long, but I think the value was it new or secondhand? It was secondhand. So like, a, a, right, okay, yeah. But I would never have changed anything on it. I don't even think I would have cleaned it and it, it still roared. Yeah. 
still moved, still yeah. pedaled, went round. Okay, so I've worked out. This is, well, I guess it's not even controversial. I know where innovation needs to happen. The innovation needs to happen in the secondary market. There needs to be better stuff happening. Like maybe the big brands should like take in secondhand bikes, re fix them up themselves and then get them to people, sell them, actually sell. Imagine, I don't know, a big bright brand, Scott, actually had like a secondhand market on their own website. So, you know, so you, you upgrade your bike, kind of like phones. Yeah, it's just like phones. So you've got your bike, you want to upgrade it, you give your bike back, they give you some money for it. You, that comes off of your, you basically, you know, part exchange it for a better bike. And then that one they've got back, they tidy it up, clean it, and then sell it on the secondary market. So they'll still make money, but it'll get to someone much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Particularly as a lot of, a lot of bikes are repairable. Mm -hmm. Carbon's repairable. Yep. Alloy you might struggle. Steel bike's fine. Yep. Titanium is fine. Everything can be fixed. But there is an obsession of like new, 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 isn't there? Yes. Mm -hmm. We've been hesitant to make a video on secondhand stuff because it's a hard topic to, it's a big topic to cover in a video because there's all the problems of, is something stolen? Where's it come from? Is it safe to ride? You know, there's a lot of- Is the frame cracked? Think, yeah, exactly. And it's very hard to say, yes, you can, you know, the only real advice we can give is, go to a place like Recycle Your Bike or Cycle Exchange if you're looking for a more high-end thing where the people check it over, where mm -hmm. professionals check it first. And give you a warranty. Exactly. So yeah. if something does go wrong, you can just take it back. We, we, we will work out how to explore that space mm. because we, we wanted to for a long time, but we're just very cautious to not give advice, which, is, which gets people into a scenario which is not good. Exactly. Recycle Your Bike, 50 pound challenge. 50 pound. I challenge you. I would love it if it was doable. 10 pound challenge. Should we move on? Time for another round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things and you're going to tell me if they're overrated or underrated. Cycling caps. Uh, every time. Uh, they are overrated by some and underrated by others. <laughs> no, I don't care about other people. So, I want to know your opinion. I think they're underrated. So a lot of people, there are people which are like in, like that's their thing. Cycling caps is their like thing. And they'll have like displays and they'll own like 5 billion of them. Um, just cause if you're just into them, then cool. <laughs> but where they're really good um, is, so I never used to use them because they obviously make you warmer and I didn't want to be warmer. You hate being warm. It's your well, least be, favorite thing. Well, I hate being too hot when it's hot. And and too hot for you is 15 degrees. 17. So, okay. <laughs> Where they are very good is if you choose to not choose or do not choose to have no hair on your head, they save you from weird cycling helmet tan lines. They save you from getting stung by insects. And they, well, that's about it really. Hmm. <laughs> That's right. They look kind of cool. Sometimes. They also can look hideous. It's a place to store it while you're riding. Store. On your head. Store your, ha store your cycling store cap. Store your hat on your head. You could, yeah. So then when you get off the bike, and then you don't even have to put it on to avoid the helmet hair. Or in your case, I guess there's no helmet hair, but it's, you just got a hat on. At least you don't have to go. Eh. When you stop, you take it off. When you Oh, <laughs> for a different look. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good point. Cool off. You don't have that that trouble. Yeah. I have the problem of like if you wear a helmet, like I never wear a hat under my helmet. I think this it, it's annoying. Don't want that. I like to be cool when I'm riding a bike. But when you get off the bike and you have sweaty hair and it looks all squashed, then I put a hat on. And then you look uh slightly you don't look cool, do you? Because you're still wearing lycra. But I can appreciate I think a cycling cab looks all right. People like the little um they call it luft. Luft, yeah. yep. Luft. Luft. When you like you, you put it on your it. head, but not too much. And you push it up a little bit. I'm sure people do have baseball caps as well. Like E17. Who's that? Oh, God. Heart rate monitors. Underrated. Underrated. If you're focused on performance, it's an extremely good thing 
to get and it's not very expensive. They're also good for not performance and just knowing if you're tired or not. And that's why I think they're underrated. So, oh, do you, what, like per, like on your wrist all the time or? Well, just even when just doing exercise, if you have an idea of what's normal, then if you're out doing a ride and it, it deviates from that, then you know you're fatigued or you know you're tired. So chill out. Can I add to that? Yeah. I would say they're good not for performance as well, because when I was getting to the point where I was starting to increase my distance, um, I didn't, I was basically riding too hard. And that's why I was just knackered at the end or I'd start to bonk or whatever it was and maybe not eating properly as well, but actually have starting to wear a heart rate monitor told me I need to stay in lower zones so that I can go further. And mm-hmm. I mean, obviously that seems obvious now, but... It teaches you a lot, yes. doesn't it? After a few weeks, you're like starting to get, you notice what changes. The only caveat is they are affected by the temperature, you know? Well, they aren't. Have you Your drank beers the is. night before? The heart rate, heart rate, what? The heart rate monitor isn't affected by that. Your heart rate is. Your heart rate is. Yes. And that's why it is good. So if you go on the beers the night before and then your heart rate's elevated, then that means chill out. True. Rather than... True. Or if it's hot, your body's telling you, please don't go this hard. Mm, Exactly. (laughs) You get it. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in... For most people, it's a better metric than power. It gives you feedback, whereas power relies on you knowing what you can and can't do power is is fantastic but is best used in conjunction with heart rate Mm, so it's definitely the progress you know you don't want to have a power meter without heart rate monitor but you could definitely just have a heart rate monitor Mm -hmm. and all the better because they're 30 pounds for a good one interestingly have you noticed that garmin have now got a running power metric i don't know how old this is yeah yeah yeah. i was actually listening to the running channels podcast about this oh, yeah. and they were like what the hell is power <laughs> i was like oh these noobs now well i actually don't know what it is for running it's it's supposed to be it's a formula they've made yep. which gives you a, a power reading mm. for your running which is not to just go in for your heart rate anymore we should we should definitely have a chat with them about that because i think that's quite an interesting metric so obviously it's Do not using it's not using a separate uh device Input, yeah yeah. Like obviously a power meter is literally a direct measurement of how much energy you're pushing through a pedal. So what is the running power metric? And for some reason, probably because I'm groomed to it with cycling, I just kind of like it. We're sponsored by Garmin. We can probably ask the experts there. Well, that's what I was suggesting. You, oh. I think you were suggesting something else. We'll Talking to the everyone. running channel because I kind of like them. Does Does anyone in the comments, anyone listening to this, if you are listening on the podcast... Email us if you know what it is. Please don't email us a link to Garmin. I want it in your words because that's just more interesting. And if you are watching us on YouTube, stick in the comments below. Next. 12 speed. 12 speed what? It just says 12 speed. I don't make them. Overrated. Yeah, overrated. It really is. Like past 10 speed, I don't, you barely notice the extra speeds. Well, are you ever on a bike going, thinking like, well, I'm in. I'm in my fifth gear, so I know. I know what's going on here. You just keep clicking until it doesn't click anymore. Yeah, I reckon. But if I was racing again, you know, and really trying, then perhaps I'd be like, ah, oh, twelve speed's kind of good because then you could. Well, if you're doing gravel, you could do one by, and then you got the little ten sprocket on the SRAM. It's quite cool. A ten out oh, on Shimano as well now. Yeah, finally. Um, so yeah, in that sense, that would be quite good. Being able to run one by on the gravel setup, but for road. I mean, two by 11 is fine. Two by 10 is fine. Yep. Overrated. Overrated. Expensive non-sports watches. <laughs> it's not Jimmy here. I've been targeted, haven't I? You actually suggested this when we oh, were thinking I? of a big list, but you only said expensive watches. <laughs> I added the non-sports. <laughs> oh, what a stupid suggestion, Jimmy. Um overrated <laughs> yeah for the viewers at home jimmy has purchased expensive watches before I, I like watches the most money i've ever spent on a watch is probably 100 pounds excluding the 900 pound watch you've got on your wrist which you got for free from garmin which i got for free from garmin and i probably would now i've used one i would buy one 
Okay, so. Although I'd probably go for the Forerunner or something. I've got, a, well, I'm wearing a Forerunner. You're wearing one now, yeah. But then that's probably 700 quid and it is exceptional. I really like That's the top end Forerunner. Yeah. I'm jealous of that. It's very good. Mm. Okay, so. I inherited a couple of watches from my grandfather when he passed away and I used to wear them and that's kind of programmed me into having a love of watches. He's guilt tripping us with the dead grandfather stuff. Yeah, it's I'm great. not buying it's it. A good start, isn't it? It's a good start. <laughs> I uh, very recently have completed my watch collection. Completed it? Completed it. That's it. Can we just get this? This is on the record now, Jimmy, forever and <laughs> always. If you lose one, you're allowed to replace it, though. I want to, I'm actually, I'm going to get rid of a couple. So, and I want to give this a bit more context. The most expensive watch I have is less than most people's bike. But what does it provide? What does it give you other than the time? Satisfaction. Enjoyment. Or what kind of satisfaction? Very regularly, more than... So if, if, I ride, if I ride my bike 10 hours a week, I look at my watch more than 10 hours a week and go, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, okay. I don't know. You convinced me. That's fine then. And then let's, I'll just throw some more shade on this. My... You you will own one guitar that is worth <laughs> more than coming. my entire watch coming. collection. Yeah. But guitar gives me uh, one to four hours a day of real pure enjoyment and the, doing something for myself. Therefore, I feel justified in owning some vintage guitars. Well, yeah, if, 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 you, if you're into that, do yeah. it. But that's yeah. how long Jimmy looks at his watch every day as well. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I get you could, I would have the same... Uh, I could achieve the same results or close to the same results with one guitar and play it and just use that. But it's the enjoyment. It's the, it's the, oh, that makes me happy using it and playing it and looking at it. It's the same thing as someone buying a, a 15,000 pound bike. If they can afford it and they get satisfaction out of it, why not? Why not? Yeah. So as an actual timepiece watch, massively overrated as something that's uh satisfying underrated what's the most you'd ever spend on a watch uh where's the cutoff where it gets stupid because there, there was that you I, the cav documentary do you remember we watched that clip and you're like two hundred thousand pound watch i and it looks like a bubblegum watch where the front opens and you get bubblegum inside it does it's a yeah richard mill it looks it looks sh yeah, it's horrible. It's well, I don't over. get it. I don't get it. If I was going to get a posh watch, I'd get one that looks legit. I, I've had, I had the opportunity to get a Rolex Explorer, which is would have cost about six and a half thousand pounds. And I couldn't do it because that is a grotesque amount of money for a watch. Okay. So I would, I would never spend that kind of money on a watch. I have spent a couple of grand on a watch, but it's something that is means a lot to me and I will keep for literally the rest of my life. It isn't an investment. It isn't um it isn't to be flash. It's something that I just get a lot of pleasure from. Mm, investment. Well that that's that's why most people buy a Rolex is because they're thinking it's gonna make them money. Really? Thinks they're gonna get rich from it. The COVID yes. effect. Tattoos. Underrated? And over? Oh, God. Uh, underrated. Don't young people, they don't think they're cool anymore because everyone's got tattoos. So now the new generation of people are like... Apparently they don't think skin is cool anymore either for the same reason. Skin. Mm, or eyeballs. There is actually a thing where people scrape their skin off and create patterns. And it's in like tattoo places do that. You want about scarification? Yeah. Yeah, they just cut chunks out of their oh, flesh. Oh, that's horrible. I mean, uh, well, you brought it up. Yeah, but you're describing it in detail. <laughs> anyway, I I think they are underrated as uh, a form of expression. Hmm. I I think they're uh, wow. Well, I, I used to be really precious about it when I was younger, and I I spent ages trying to work out what I wanted and what I didn't want. And the older I get, the less I care. And I'm just like, yeah, I'll just have that. And now I've got like Skeletor on the side of my arm just because I thought it would be funny. Well, like me and Scott got them. I'm going to say overrated. Do you know why? No. Because if you get them on your wrists, then your watch doesn't work properly. Your smartwatch, which has to read your heart rate, 
doesn't work if you have a tattoo. I'm yet to underneath it. So so I'm legitimately wearing my forerunner on the underside of my wrist after having a conversation with Francis because <laughs> there's a possibility that the heart rate sensor doesn't work as well over tattooed skin and I have tattoos on the tops of my wrist. Do you have a lot of tattoo on your wrist? Uh no. Under, yeah. The closest I have is this this one here. Yeah. Which is lovely, lovely flower. And then it's a xenomorph alien. Mm -hmm. But if you just see it there, it's a lovely flower. <laughs> lovely flower. Yeah. But it doesn't interfere with my watch. Time for fluff up of the week. <laughs> headphones. Jimmy bought us all lovely headphones, which you guys are wearing right now. Mine are on the floor. Here they are. Unfortunately, I don't like them. If you put them on, I can now hear myself in my ears, which is very disconcerting. I don't like it. You should always be able to hear yourself in your ears. It now sounds like you're in like next to me. Uh, horrible. Horrible. Sorry. Thanks for the present, but no thanks. So the whole purpose of the headphones is um, the theory is that if you have headphones on, you talk over each other less. And you have better awareness of whether you're talking into the microphone or not, because that doesn't sound very good, but that <laughs> sounds great. And I can hear that very clearly. Whereas Francis, without headphones, doesn't isn't able to hear what we are all listening to right now. To be fair, Francis's problem isn't that he doesn't talk in the microphone, it's that he talks so loud it bleeds into our microphones, mm -hmm. which is why we've had to change the setup to get away from him a little bit more. Yep. But I have to do work to cut out our cut out your bleed into our audio i am so far away from you guys i almost need headphones to hear you it should be further you are to so honest. small you're like i need binoculars let's finish up with listeners takeover we've got a question from liam i'm currently riding a 2017 giant tcr advanced one full carbon frame and altegra group set however it only has rim brakes i paid 600 pounds for this second hand bargain I ride once a week, maybe less. Is it really worth upgrading to a newer bike which has discs? Thanks, Liam. Little Welsh flag emoji. Liam the Taffy. All Welsh people know each other, so you must know. Yes, yeah, Liam. That works, right? Yep. I think that's a fantastic bike. What's nothing wrong with that at all? 2017. It's like, it's, mod, it's modern. There is no reason to upgrade that bike. Except for the reason you would buy a new watch. If it makes you happy, or if you do all of your rides in the wet rain in Wales, I can see why disc disc brakes would be nice. Yeah, but if he's been riding that for a few years and he's like, well, it works. Ignorance is bliss. Then you don't need the disc brakes. The biggest issue with upgrading tech in cycling is it gives you a new expectation of what's normal. So, for example... Once you start riding electric gears, you're not going to want to to, to ride mechanical. You you can, and you obviously will. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you can't necessarily have electric gear on every single bike unless you're really rich. But once you just go boop and everything just works, it's hard to not want it. Yeah, I think that's a wicked bike. I would, I guess, if he was upgrading, he'd be selling it and buying a new one. If the budget, I I would suggest instead. If there's the option, get a gravel bike. Or is it a second bike, an additional yeah, if, bike? Yeah, if, 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 you know, I, I feel like that's a logical progression for people who are looking at maybe upgrading from a road bike they've had for a while. Yes, I'm definitely into it. Yes, I love cycling. Um, you're not going to be able to, a, a rim brake road bike off road is not going to be very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're going to upgrade to disc, you can then suddenly get more tire clearance. You can ride off-road stuff, and it opens up a whole new world of cycling. Like, kind of depends where you are. Gravel though. paths around. Well, I, Wales, where? <laughs> where would be the gravel paths? We did some. Well, we know in North Wales there's bucket loads. Loads. South Wales, I don't think there's that much. Because mm. obviously there's the Taff Trails. So it's basically old canal paths and the River Taff, which basically runs from Cardiff right the way up into the valleys. Yeah. But it's just. I believe it's just a path following the river so you could do it on a road bike i think you could for some of it yeah chat to your mates i guess see what see what's see what the options are it's always if if the value is if you're looking for a value proposition a good space is a gravel bike which you can also put 
smaller tires on. Definitely. So it's essentially a gravel bike that is also a road bike if you want it to be, because then you've just got more options. Yeah, totally. However, if you don't have any issues with your bike and you don't particularly want to upgrade, then you don't need to. Disc brakes are cool, but they're not needed. Well, that's all from this episode. Remember, you can send us your funny stories, questions, and other fun stuff at wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. Subscribe, follow, leave us a review, and we will see you next time. We never actually see them, though, don't we? Do we? They see us, though. They see us, maybe. Yeah. Or here. Yeah. Us. Maybe we should start, um, like, we should get a screen up with some, like, live feed on it or something. What of all of our audience's webcams, which yeah. we can hack into? Yeah, or just yeah. Ask, ask them for access rather than doing something legal. Nah. Can we watch you guys? We'd like to watch you all the time.